Um, online folk, I've got the chat open, so feel free to put anything you'd like in the chat, and I will do my best to monitor that. Um, so as I said, Genesis chapter 2, we're about to get an author switch, and we'll try to discern if we notice any reasons why scholars think that Genesis chapter 2 is a different author from Genesis chapter 1. But our chapter headings are a little arbitrary, and so the very first verses of chapter two are actually going to tie into the Genesis one story and wrap us up. And then we'll try to dig into what exactly is going on in terms of what is different. What are the different viewpoints? What are the different emphasis? So here we go. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude on the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So we have the seventh day, a day of rest, a day that is hallowed by God. And so remembering when this text is written down, we have two different justifications for the Sabbath. When the Ten Commandments are issued to the Israelites, the justification for the Sabbath is to remember what it was like to work in bondage seven days a week, that they became basically property, that they were known by what they produced. And so God is telling them that they are worth more than what they produce, and so therefore they should rest on the seventh day. So that's the justification they have kind of within their circles after the Ten Commandments are issued. But here we're told that they rest on the seventh day because God rests on the seventh day. And if God does not need to labor constantly, then so too people should not need to labor constantly. This verse is kind of an interesting throwaway verse. Perhaps there's text that's missing. We're not actually given a generational account here. It doesn't necessarily tie into what comes before. So not quite sure what to do with this verse. Any comments, questions about these last few verses of the first creation account? Yeah, Donna. Yeah, so you're saying this feels as if he's taking God down a peg. This God needs to rest, can't, doesn't have the stamina to work seven days but it's speaking to real life human experience. Yeah, what a powerful testimony that these folks writing down their experience of God would write down that this God rested. Um, you're right, it seems like it could be a weakness depending on your theological perspective. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Dini? Where did they get the idea of a seven day week? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I'm not too up to date on my history of calendars. Like did calendars already exist at this point that had a seven day week? But that's a good question. I'll have to look into that. Calendars came pretty early. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's evidence of calendars existing already. I heard it because the typical donation to me means dividing it by four. Yeah, that they, they already understood patterns of the moon at this point, yeah. But the moon is totally At a certain point, you're out of sync. This, yes, you can read historical accounts of how they adjusted for this. 
using various calendars. Interesting. Okay. Fascinating. Thanks, Robin. So Babylonians, historical record that Babylonians had taken the 28-day lunar calendar, divided it into four equal parts. There's also suggestion that the origin of the seven-day week comes from the Hebrews, that they practiced it based on what they established as the creative patterns of God. Or there was ancient beliefs in these seven celestial bodies. And so that is the seven days of the week. Okay. All right. Carrying on. Very interesting that the New Revised Standard Version, adding their own heading, says another account of the creation. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. All right, let's pause there for, actually, let's continue on. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. What are the differences you notice between chapter 2 and chapter 1? This is specific. This seems to be specific. It's narrowing in on the creation of humanity. Chapter one seems to be much more generic, cosmic. Yeah. Seems like woman's an afterthought. Also, <laughs> what'd you say? Watch it, watch it. <laughs> Uh, and Kevin's noting verse five, no plant of the field is yet on the earth. 
when God is forming man from the dust of the ground. So there's a different ordering of creation. Perhaps as a way to put primacy on the creation of humanity. Other observations? Yeah, Malachi? So is this heading redundant? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So in in our original Hebrew text, we would have none of these headings, we would have none of the chapters, none of the verses. And so it's almost as if it's signaling that it's a different creation account. Um, just by by virtue of the preposition that starts off this verse, um, it's almost signaling itself that there's something new here. Great observation. Anything else? Surely, just saying it seems as if this pattern is much different. Women, the woman not being created at the same time and ushering all these animals out. What do you think of this animal? What its name do you have for it? Um, I know it's hot in here, but are people okay if I turn this one off for noise purposes, or would you prefer it on? Your call. Okay, you're out, you're good with it on. You got it. Doesn't matter to me. Just checking in. There we go. Uh, yeah, good observation, Shirley. So what do people feel about the fact that there's two very different creation accounts? Does this bother you? Does it make sense to you? Do you appreciate that there's two? Yeah. Yeah. So the language of this doesn't speak to you as much. It's not as poetic. The dirt part you like, making humanity out of dirt. Other observations? What do you make of the fact that we have two different creation accounts? Yeah, Diane? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The fabled Garden of Eden that the Hebrew people write about is not in the Americas. It's in their area. And here it is. They're very localized. They're naming their rivers where they believe it is. Exactly. They're speaking to the people who are passing on this oral tradition. They already know the concept of Assyria. Yeah. Wendy? So here's a funny story. When I was little, younger, um, I read this and I thought, or I heard this and I thought, oh, the way to tell the difference between a man and a woman is the man is missing a wrist. <laughs> and then imagine my um, shock 
when I went to do biology and <laughs> found out that the only way, or anatomy, the only way to tell the difference between a man and a woman was the angle of, or size of their pelvis. Interesting. Just, uh, you know, when you're little, you think, oh, this is the word. Yeah, so Wendy was saying when she was little, she was told the difference between telling the difference between a man and a woman is that the man's missing a rib. And so being taught when you're younger that this is the word of God and this is how it happened and then coming to understand that that's not always the case. Uh, let's see here in the chat. Lisa says this account seems more specific, more detailed, given that there are other traditions that have similar creation stories that predate ours. It seems to be taken from those stories. Yeah, and this one has unique elements compared to some of the other creation accounts, particularly this part of creating humanity from the dust of the ground. All right, so you've narrowed in on some of the bigger observations here that we've gone from a very poetic cosmic account of creation where everything is very orderly. The point of the first creation account is to suggest that God has the power to tame the chaos that existed before creation. And it's this overview that everything within the universe is because of the creative powers of God. I was watching an interesting video yesterday speaking about merism, which is a literary device where you post two extremes as a way to say what encompasses everything in between. And so God creates the heavens and the earth, these two poles, but also everything else in between, the day and the night, and yet also dusk and dawn and twilight, male and female, and all other expressions of gender or humanity as well. But then we have this brushstroke that comes in on the specific. This is a way to take the story from the cosmic to what I would consider the moral. What does it mean for us to be able to decide between good and evil? And so we're setting the stage that here is God creating humanity from the dust of the ground. Humanity is not just apart from nature. Humanity is nature itself. Um, this we know is scientific, that we're made up of the dust of the universe, that our cells have been around since the creation of the universe, and we will return to dust physically. So there's something very interesting in how what we understand now to be scientific ties into the theological here, that God is creating from the dust of the earth. It's meant to put the human in focus in this second creation story before even the vegetation has sprung up on the earth. And so God creates the human and also creates all the vegetation kind of simultaneously. And we're told that there are a few specific unique trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so these trees are meant to serve purposes in Genesis two and three of trying to answer bigger questions. What does it mean that we don't live forever? And what does it mean that we're capable of both good and evil? And these stories will try to explain it. So then as Diane pointed out to us, we get this very localized geographic explanation of where these rivers are in relation to the Garden of Eden. God takes man and puts man to work. Now, later, during the punishment for the fall, we're told that this work becomes toilsome and wearisome. And so at this point, the working of the garden is life-giving, we're told, that being part of the ground and working the ground is meant to be very spiritual, very connective to the rest of creation. But God feels that humanity is alone, and so it's based on, again, putting the human as kind of the primary focus of this chapter, that the rest of creation is ushered forward for the sake of the human. We talked a little bit last week about what that means in terms of these concepts of dominion or authority, that the authority humanity has is based on the authority of God, and so that should inform how we live out so-called authority. 
But the animals are not enough. And so God puts the man to sleep and creates a woman and says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The man, uh, the word for man is Adam, which comes from the Hebrew word Adema, which means ground. And then the word Eva, meaning life, the source of life, is where we get the word for woman, being the source of life. And we're told that this woman is meant to serve as helper. So Jim and Marcy, I see you're on. Thanks. Uh, Jim Ellison sent me a paper he wrote in seminary on this term. Um, and so it was fun to read that, Jim. But uh, as you were saying, Toby, this passage is at the root of so much of patriarchal teachings that will come throughout history. This idea that woman was created seconds and created for the purpose of being a helper to the partner will be rooted in this creation story. But interestingly, the Hebrew word for helper, azer, is a term that's used to refer to God at other points in scripture, that God functions as helper to humanity. And so I don't think we would use that to suggest God is therefore submitting to humanity or God is under humanity, but there's this role of mutual support of one another that seems to be at the basis for this word. So the word's not used often, but it is used at another point in Hebrew literature to refer to God. Yeah, Donna. Yeah. Yeah. So we have cuneiform writings of a creation story called the Enuma Elish. And in this creation story, there is a war between gods, and one god destroys another god and tears that god in half and makes that god's body the top and the bottom of the dome of the earth. So it's a very different creation story than this. There are parallels, but but it's different. Yeah. But that's an interesting one to read, a short one, the Enuma Elish, if you want to read it. All right. And so we also have here... Oh, we're using these oral traditions, these stories, as a way to explain cultural events. So is there a reason culturally or sociologically as to why people leave their ancestral home and start a new life? So verse 24, therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. We're told that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so that will be part of chapter three. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother. But it doesn't really go with this thought that follows, which seems more in conjunction with what's come before. Yeah. So Toby say verse 24 seems a little bit out of place. Um, we get instances like that all the time, only because there are parts of the oral tradition that are being left out as it's being written down. Things are appended at different times in the written record. And so we have sometimes verses that are in the written record that seem a little bit out of place only because of the history of how it gets from oral tradition to written text. And so I agree that it seems as if someone's reading this poetic part and most likely these little poetic nuggets that we get are much earlier where they're kind of put into the text because they're written down much earlier 
and then someone came along and added that explanation. So we're going to notice verses like that at times. Yeah, Diane? Yeah, great question. Um, it is it is different, um, but it is being taken from a word, just like the word for man is being taken out of the word for ground. The word for woman is being taken out of the Hebrew word for life. Yeah, for life. Yeah. 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 So Kevin was saying familiar with the English translation of cleaves as opposed to cleans and clean seems such more of like a dependent of grasping of holding on to something. Um, and the Hebrew word here is much more. I would call it. Yeah, it's definitely not the grasping imagery that we get from cleans. It's more of a, a smashing together. Uh, of even there are, there are two separate entities, they're coming, they're becoming one flesh. Yeah, good observation. Yeah, Ben? Uh, just uh, thinking about the two different versions of the creation story and uh, also in terms of like, uh, you know, how the Gospels kind of tell different stories. Uh, and the tradition has been going towards reconciliation. Like, oh, it just all happened. It just told in different ways or by different people. Um, so that that uh, approach of saying, well, you know, things are going to be reconciled seems to be way, way older than it's just, you know, the New Testament. Um, and I was looking to see the Hebrew, you looking at the Bible that we referred us to last time. Um, and in 2.4, it says, um, in the day that made that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens, or it says Yahweh gave a king. It's not a boat. Um, so I think that the reconciliation about, you know, is it a multiple multiplicity of deities that are pre, you know, monotheistic or henotheistic, whatever uh, ancestors were looking at or think conceptualizing, and also the monotheistic Yahweh, uh, you know, kind of come together. Smash together, like clean here. Uh, yeah, that's great. And I think that's something for us um, as Bible readers to keep in mind as well. Ben was saying that already early there's an attempt at reconciling these accounts. So I mentioned that within the various authors of Genesis, and of course, this is all scholarly conjecture. We don't know how many authors there are. Scholars are just pointing to different uses of the names for God, different vocabulary, different themes, and coming up with what they think are the different authors of scripture. But it's all conjecture. Um, and so one reason why there are two different creation accounts here is a difference in what name is used for God. And Ben was saying that at the beginning of chapter two, it puts both of those names together, Yahweh and Elohim. And so already there's an attempt at reconciling these accounts. And how that impacts us as Bible readers, I think, is understanding that these ancient authors and readers of Scripture were very comfortable with multiple interpretations. We've talked in this class before about how the Old Testament answers the problem of the existence of evil in about nine different ways, some of them contradictory with each other. And so the fact that contradictions exist didn't make the Jewish people uncomfortable. That's part of their religious tradition. Somewhere along the way within Christian biblical interpretation, we became very uncomfortable with contradictions. And if anything remotely didn't make sense with another piece, immediately we had to go into explanatory mode and try to explain it away. But I think it's good to be comfortable with 
multiple interpretations and contradictions. The Hebrew people, as we know, this is, these are fables. They're saying it could have happened this way, but also it could have happened this way. And there is meaning to be extracted from both of these versions. It didn't exactly happen this way, but we can think about bigger pictures, bigger themes, even if they don't necessarily line up. Yeah. Uh, so actually a little bit different. Um, so Yahweh, so the question is Yahweh Elohim, what are the differences here? Um, so Yahweh is this revealed name that has a very important role to play in Hebrew religious traditions. So we get the term Yahweh when um, Moses is on Mount Sinai and asks for God to reveal God's self. And we're told, uh, Yahweh, I am who I am. That I am just God, I am being in and of itself. A lot of the other names we get for God are based on experiences of God. So, for example, we're told that um, when Hagar is in the wilderness and experiences God, Hagar names God and says, you are the God who sees me. And so that's the name given to God. So Elohim um, has its roots in um, mountain peaks. Um, and so I think of the verse, where does my help come from? It comes from the hills. Um, it's actually a term that could refer to breasts. Um, so similar to mountain peaks. And so it's not necessarily a, an action word, but more of a noun word um, to describe like the God of the mountains or the God who comes from the mountains. Um, and then L, of course, is just uh, a, a God. Um, a word that from Hebrew and Arabic we know of is, is God. In chapter one, verse one, what is, who is, what is the Hebrew that Is that Yahweh or Yahweh appears later, right? Say that again. What is the God that is in the beginning. What, what is the Jewish, the Hebrew word for that? Oh, in the beginning. Yeah. In yeah. chapter one, verse one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we mentioned that a little bit last week, um, that it's not necessarily a beginning point, And it's why our, whoa. No, you're okay. Um, and that's why in our New Revised Standard Version, a lot of more updated translations, it says when God began to create. Um, and so it's not necessarily a starting point for everything, but the point at which God started to create. So I guess my question is, we've been talking about El and how we say it in Yahweh and stuff. What is the word that is used directly right there at the beginning? What is the Hebrew word? Okay, oh, the Bereshit. So, um, so the ba is a preposition, meaning in, and rashit meaning basically uh, um, the start of something. Yeah, what's the question? Oh, thank you. Are those later creation? Because this sounds like the big bang or whatever. It 
Yeah, so you're saying when does I mean, Yahweh come into play? Yahweh, which is what the name can't actually be said. Yeah. Not said. And then the Lord Jesus comes into play. Yeah. Okay. Right at the very beginning of the Bible, we have God, you know. So what? Yeah, the word used is Elohim, which would have been this ancient form of God. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, a note from Marcy and Jim. So this other word that is translated as partner in Genesis 2, nowhere else in the Bible. It's a legal term that a rich man and a poor man on, are on equal standing before the judge which means that he or she has power. Yeah, so there's a lot more equity in these words than have been used throughout the history of interpretation of the Bible. So that's an important part of interpreting the Bible is that we don't just interpret the Bible, but we understand the history of interpreting the Bible because that has a role to play in how people try to interpret the Bible. All right, jump back to Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. All right. Let's start off by asking what observations do you have about the serpent? Serpent gets a bad rap. Say more. Yeah, you're in the desert. What are you afraid of? It's going to be a snake. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, who's telling the truth here? God or the serpent? The serpent says, you're not going to die. They eat the fruit, and they don't die. And they know good and evil. Yeah, so that is an important question to ask here. Who's telling the truth? Um, we'll talk about that in a second. We start with the fact that God created that serpent. It happens to be the crafty one. The serpent is part of creation. But it's, I mean, it's, it's that question that, you know, as a, as a Native American, you learn what really quickly. You can argue either side and make it sound really good. Hmm. And once you can do that, you can do that forever. And there's a positive to that to help people see both sides, but it also means you've got some power to pull the wool over people's eyes. Yeah. And so, you know, that is what is truth, and it's a it's a question that's starting right here. Um. So, asking. In terms of, <laughs> as you, uh, Shirley was saying, as a debater, you learn that you can argue both sides of something, and be convincing. And so there's something that's positive to that, helping people see both sides, or something negative to that. You have the power to deceive someone by arguing a position you don't believe. Yeah, Robin. I guess, I don't know, this is just my impressions about all this. One more thing that helped me realize that this is written by the Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so Robin, just saying, this seems like more evidence that we have multiple authors at stake here, at play here, um, referring to a friend they know who has this universe, a story universe that he's created, but there's continuity to it where there's editing to make sure that it makes sense and it's internally consistent. But yeah, we're not getting that here with scripture where we have different perspectives and different points of view. Yeah. Um, and Kevin asking, when it says more crafty than any other wild animal, does that mean that it's making sure to say not more crafty than humans? Although it does seem to be here. Are we considered wild? Have we been civilized or tamed yet? Good question. And I think it's interesting. Good and evil ends up to sexuality. That is um, something that I would say is not in the text as we read forward. So there's no reference necessary. There is to there is and to nakedness, nakedness, nakedness but general. not necessarily. Sexuality. Yeah, good question, good question. And, and we'll get to that, for sure. Um, all right, any other observations about the serpents? Okay, it seems like it's a plot device. You have to have opposition to move the story forward. Um, so just a few quick observations about serpents, and that's where we'll have to end for today. First, in the ancient Near East, serpents were viewed as repositors of wisdom. Um, and so it makes sense that a serpent would be the interlocutor here as the one trying to bestow wisdom or knowledge upon humanity. We are not told anything about devils or Satan. That tradition doesn't exist yet. As you noted, the serpent is part of creation. So this isn't a devil figure, but instead is just a talking serpent. There's a lot of interesting serpent imagery within scripture that's not all negative. So the story of when Moses, there's this very strange story Whereas punishment, God sends poisonous snakes into the camp of the Israelites. And in order to be healed from the poison from those snakes, Moses makes a bronze serpent and raises it on a pole. And all who look at the serpent will be healed. We're later going to get the scene in the Gospel of John where it's a Garden of Eden scene, where it's Mary Magdalene and Jesus. And Jesus kind of plays the role of the serpent talking with Eve as he talks with Mary Magdalene. And again, we're going to get reference connecting Jesus being lifted up on a cross to that bronze serpent lift, being lifted up. Whoever lifts up their eyes to see the crucified Christ will be healed. So the serpent imagery is not all negative. The serpent is playing a role here in helping humanity come to terms with its moral agency. And we'll dig more into that next time. Um, While you were talking about I don't know. That's a good question. That one I'll have to look up. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the question is, are, when Jesus calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers, is that a different classification from a snake? And Robin was well, giving us an explanation. Right? Because he is made to crawl on the ground later. Yeah, suppose, know, like, that's right, that's right. <laughs> is he a dinosaur? Uh, so Toby's question is, it's not actually a snake slithering on its belly yet, because that's going to be punishment for this scene. 
yeah, it's supposedly something different, that the serpent is not a slithering snake quite yet. Yeah. Um, okay, so what we have set the scene here is basically what is the purpose of the fall story? What is it trying to explain? And next time we're together, we'll dig into my thinking as to this is an origin story for our moral agency, that we are capable, like God, of deciding between right and wrong. And what does that mean for us as humanity? Um, so I apologize, um, just the way the scheduling is going to work. Jen and I are doing another IVF retrieval, and the retrieval is going to fall on a Sunday again. So unless something changes over these next couple of days, most likely we'll be out of town again next week. Um, so then we'll meet again the following week. So just pay attention to the Friday email, but assume, assume no Bible study next week, and then we'll pick up the following week. All right. Any other last comments? I know. I know. We're going to be in suspense over these two weeks. Some of the best stuff in Genesis. I know. It is a little cruel. I feel that way. All right, let me close this with a word of prayer. Um, God, we thank you uh, as we look into this creation story, as we think about our origins, as we think about your creative work. We pray that we can be inspired by who you are, by your creative work in this world, that we too can be creators, that we too can be thinking of how to help everything around us flourish. We thank you that we are part of creation. We thank you that you care for us and that you are with us. And we pray for your guidance as we watch the news and attempt to bring your love and peace into this world. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Uh, Lisa, thank you for that question. How is good and evil being defined? We'll pick that up next session.